Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 7. Um, just pick up there and uh, share with you a few things. And instead of reading the whole chapter, I'm going to do this just one verse at a time. Uh, there's some things in each one of these verses that stuck out to me as we uh, spent time in study. And so I just want to start by doing that. And so I invite your attention to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. Passage reads, He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away from you, and your sin is forgiven. We left off there this morning, and I didn't get a chance to share with you all of the things that I would like to share. Uh, in fact, as I started preparing for this sermon, I was going to preach through the whole chapter. You can't do that with this chapter. In fact, probably take about three or four sermons to do it uh, a real good justice to it, just these 13 passages. But when it comes to this and understanding the grace that God has lavished on us, I came across a story from Progressive Magazine um, back from 1992. Billy Graham had been driving through a small southern town, and he got pulled over for speeding. And as he was being given the ticket, of course, the officer recognized who he was and everything. And, and uh, Dr. Graham said, I'm guilty. I, I, uh, I was speeding. And so the officer wrote out the ticket, and, and uh, he said, you'll have to go see the judge. And so he made the arrangements, and he went and stood before the judge. And as he did, the judge didn't even lift up his head. If you've been in some of those traffic courts and stuff like that, sometimes they say, uh, guilty or innocent, and they're, they're looking for you to or no contest, whichever the case may be. And uh, Billy Graham immediately, when the judge asked that, said, I'm guilty. And the judge looked up and saw that it was Billy Graham, and he said, you know that I have to find you. And that's just part of the law. You pled guilty. I don't have a choice in this. And so he told him how much he needed to pay and uh, everything like that. And the judge, the judge stood up, took out his wallet, and he paid the fine for Billy Graham. And then after that, he took him to lunch and a steak lunch and everything like that. You know, we laugh at that story, but when we understand what God's grace is all about. I think that's a kind of a, uh, a good story for us to just spend a moment to consider. Um, we're guilty. We're guilty, and someone had to pay the price. And the good thing about it is when we admit that we're guilty, there's blessings that come from that. And a lot of people don't understand that. When we stand before God humble and, and just we're guilty and dependent upon Him, you'll be surprised where that puts you in relationship with Him. It puts you as a penitent child. It puts you as, as someone who's learned something from this experience. You know, when your children learn something uh, from an experience in their life and, and you're just thrilled because they finally get it. Can you imagine our Heavenly Father? The rest of that story about the, the, the steak dinner, you see, the price has already been paid for our sin through Jesus Christ. But then the steak dinner was the blessing that God gives us for acknowledging the greatness of who He is and the fact that it's only through Him, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we can be forgiven. And what a blessing that is for us to know. So as we look at this, Isaiah had experienced God's grace. He did nothing to accomplish, uh, accomplish this or, or, or cause it to happen. His atonement came because of what God set forth and what God did. No longer could guilt or sin keep him from the Father. When that coal was touched to his lips, God's grace was applied and forgiveness was given. One of the hardest things for people in our world today is to understand that God's grace and forgiveness is for real. And we have such a hard time because we want to continue to punish ourselves. That's the guilt of, of sin. That's not of God. God says, I'll forgive you. Not only will I forgive you, I want you to know that that guilt is gone. Because you've turned from what you were doing. And I forgive you. Most of the time we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, don't we? It's not about what God's prepared to do. God's already stated what he did, will do and he's faithful to do it. When we admit that we have sinned and are unable to fix ourselves, if we confess to the Father, he is faithful to purify and to forgive. I wonder if that, those words kind of sounded like something that may have come from like 1 John 1 9. Yeah. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a sincerity about recognizing what our sin is. It's not just forgive us our sins, amen. 
It's about recognizing the damage that it's caused. To recognize how important it is for us to live uh, with this kind of understanding. You've all seen trapeze artists as they swing back and forth. And it's interesting that as all the people down below, they usually don't have a three-ring three, three ring circus. They usually, when the trapeze artists are up there, they don't have all three rings working. Usually, it, it, everybody's focus is on the trapeze artists. And as you watch them, you're sitting there watching them, and as they go, you're back and forth, and everyone in the place is looking up and watching that trapeze artist. Now, isn't it interesting that as that trapeze artist might miss a, a hand or not grab something right and they fall, Everybody goes, but there's the net. The net catches them, and if you watch what they do, they get off the net, they climb back up the tower, and they continue on with whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing up there, and they get back on the bar and start swinging again and do what they've been trained to do. You know, I liken that unto us as Christians. You see, when we accept Jesus Christ, we become a trapeze artist, if we can use that little picture. And everybody begins looking at us, watching our every move. And when we fall, the world, <gasps> look, but usually it's not where I'm concerned for you. It's more like, aha, I caught you. <laughs> but isn't it neat that God's net is below us? There's never a time that in this analogy, in this picture, there's never a time that that trapeze artist ever just falls to the ground because there's a net there to catch them. You know, with sin, it's like being a trapeze artist with no net. But there's a net there, God's forgiveness. And the forgiveness, when they don't grab something right, they've made a mistake, and it's very unforgiving because all you can do is fall. But you know, when we fall, God catches us. When we recognize what's going on, He catches us, and He allows us to get off the net and get right back up there where we're supposed to be. It, it's a picture of us not being perfect. It's a picture of what God's grace does and the forgiveness that he gives. For Christians, it ought to be something that gives us confidence, not so that we can go up there and say, hey, watch this, I'm going to just miss it so I can fall in the net. But to do our very best as we're up there, where people are watching, because what they're seeing is Christian, they're seeing the people of God. And the world is watching. God has that net when we do fall, when we do have sin in our lives, but that net is not there so we can just lay on the net and say, hey, this is pretty cool looking up there at them and watching all this. That net's only there for us to realize that there's forgiveness there and we can get back off the net and get back up and doing what we're supposed to be doing. You know how many people get, get stymied because they fall and they go, oh my goodness, God's so mad and everything. Wouldn't it just be better if I just stay here laying on the net? Just stay there and lay on his net of forgiveness and, and, and not ever worry about anything else. And we, we feel sorry for ourselves. I blew that one. And we want to stay there. But God says, get back up there. There's people that need to see. And you see, if there were no forgiveness, if there were no way that we could see God's forgiveness in passages like 1 John 1, 9, and see uh, this passage in Isaiah chapter 6, looking at verse 7, if, if we couldn't see those things where there was any hope beyond our, our, our sin, if there was nothing where there was grace, can you imagine how dismal it would be to be a Christian? If there's no hope of forgiveness and whatever we do from the time we accept Jesus Christ just piles up over in the corner and when we get to heaven, man, we're going to hit the, wood, uh, the, the woodshed and God's got switches for us out there to just beat the daylights out of us. But it doesn't work that way. He wants you to be unencumbered when we do sin. When things happen, He wants us to be able to get off the net, know that we're forgiven, and get back to doing what He's called us to do. It's interesting because as... as Isaiah understands this. In the next, the very next verse, verse 8, the call of God engages us totally, not merely in the religious sector of our life. You see, he says, Then I heard a voice, in verse 8, I heard a voice uh, of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Once you've been to a place where you understand God's forgiveness, and then it came at a high price. It's not something that we want to just do all the time. When I first started being a basketball official, uh, my favorite thing was to give out a technical foul. And, and you know, if you looked at me wrong, <laughs> if a coach said something I didn't like, I'd... and the more I called basketball, 
the more I realized that that's not what the technical foul was for. I began to understand <coughs> not the letter of what a technical foul could do, but the spirit of why it was there. And I realized it's not something to be thrown around just, just uh, uh, haphazardly. And I understood the fullness of what was going on. That's like sin. You see, sin just tears us apart. And, and we understand sin and we say, oh, it's just a terrible thing and, 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 and everything. But the reality of it is God's forgiveness is us learning the spirit of what it's all about. Because most of the time we go, oh, no, i got to take a file. i got to go sit down. After two of those, by the way, in basketball, you have to go sit down. And if you're a coach, you have to put a seatbelt on. It means you can't stand up. Coach your boys. You have to sit down and do it. But the reality of it is it's something that causes us to take a moment of pause and say, wait a minute. And so while I would throw those out, there were other things I should have been doing, but I was paying attention on my side of it to, to, to use what I knew at the point. And that was the one that had the most power, so I used it. But you see, in our lives, the same thing happens. We see things like a technical foul, or we see a sin that we've done that's so big that we just can't get past it. We, we allow the guilt to just swarm in and just stay with us. And you know, when I started learning what it was all about and learning that that technical foul, that's not the way I was supposed to be using it. And when I understand about God's forgiveness, it's not just something I can flippantly just use and go, oh yeah, I forgive it. Everything's good. It's all great. No problems. The reality, it ought to break my heart every time that I have to go to him for forgiveness. That's the contriteness of my heart. That's the contriteness of your heart. To go to him and say, I'm sorry. I know I've done something wrong. It's not something to be flippantly used like I would use the, the, the technical fouls. It's supposed to be designed so that when we go to him, we recognize and, and our brokenness before him. To say, Lord, I'm sorry. You see, when it's with a contrite heart, oftentimes you will remember the sting and the pain of what you just went through and you'll not try and do that again. Because you know not only did it hurt you, but more importantly, it hurt the one that you love. Well, we ought not to use God's forgiveness in any way other than the way that it was designed. But it's there for us. He says, send me. This wasn't just about his religious sector in his life. It wasn't about just uh, the time that he's at church. He had been forgiven and he understood the depth and the scope of that forgiveness and it wasn't just given out just, here, let me just pass these out. It was given by a loving God to a sinful, hopeless man. So when he responds back to him, Lord, here am I, send me. It was not just magical words because you could sit there and go, well, okay, I'll say those words. Lord, send me. But it wasn't about the magical words of what he said. It was about his heart condition when he said them. When we say, Lord, use me, are we thinking of all the ways that we can hide the things from God we don't want him to use? Or do we say, Lord, send me and whatever, whatever is my lot, I will do that for you. It's an attitude of the heart, not an attitude of, hey, I'll do that because uh, it'll make me look good. It's an attitude that says, I want to make him look good. Well, he has a very difficult task. He has to go to people that uh, God says, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. That's what he's supposed to go and tell these people. They're not listening to what's really being said. Franklin Roosevelt, when he was president, one of the things that he hated was after he gave a speech or after uh, some type of speaking engagement or something there was always a reception line and he hated it because people would constantly just come by and shake his hand and it really didn't matter what he had said he knew that and so in his frustration at one of these events he decided that uh, he was going to throw a little special thing in there and he was shaking people's hand and he would lean forward and whisper in their ear and he would say i murdered my grandmother this morning <laughs> And their response back was, uh, Marvelous, keep up the good work. We're pleased with what you're doing. And finally, toward the end of this particular reception line, uh, the ambassador from Bolivia, he said that in his ear. And when it happened, the ambassador kind of stepped back and, and, and you know, he paid attention to what he had to say. And he leaned back over and he said this to, uh, to Roosevelt. He said, uh, I'm sure she had it coming. 
Do we listen? You know, we hear the churchy words, we hear the churchy sermons and everything like that, but do we listen to what God's saying? These people are being accused of not hearing anything. They don't want to be changed. They think that everything is just fine and moving forward, and so they don't want to listen to what the message is because it might change them. They may have to react to it. They may have to respond to it. They had become so calloused about it, though, that God's not giving them a choice about it. In fact, in the next verse, he says, render their ears to where they won't hear. In other words, keep telling them the same thing over and over and over again. I served with a pastor, and, and one of the charges that somebody laid against him to try and get him to resign was that he would witness to everybody he met. That was from a fellow Christian. He said, I just don't like the way he witnesses to everybody that he meets. And I'm sitting there going, what? And he felt like that that was a valid charge because he was witnessing. And he said, well, it makes people mad. The message of Jesus Christ to a sinner who's unwilling to repent to a sinner who sees that their life is all that they want it to be and they don't care about anything else, it will be harsh words in their hearing. They don't want to hear that. Israel didn't want to hear it. Judah didn't want to hear what Isaiah had to say. They weren't listening. And one of the greatest fears that, that I have in ministry is to come to a point where I'm not listening to what God tells me. To where I think that I've come to a stage in my life where I can say, I got this. I hope and pray that I never make comments about God's Word from the standpoint of, I can just roll that out anytime. It's no big deal to prepare a sermon. It is a big deal. Not because I've made so, but because we're studying and looking at God's Holy Word. I hope that our ears don't become dull about God's Word. And oftentimes you hear more of the negative than you do the positive. I know everybody says, you know, can't we be a little more uplifting? Can't we be... I understand something until we come to a place of contrition, until we come to a place where we don't think we're doing so well, where we realize that we have sin in our life and start dealing with that personally and then corporately with, as a church. I promise you we're not going to announce any sins from the pulpit. But the reality of it is until our spirit and our heart is that way, there's no forgiveness available. You may say, hey, I think God's forgiven me of this, but I'm going to keep on doing it. There's no forgiveness in that. When our heart isn't contrite about those things. And these people weren't listening. They weren't listening. And they would go along with whatever king was there. And they just followed that king. When Uzziah was there, the people said, let's tear down those things because King Uzziah said to him. When Jotham took over his son and then his grandson Ahaz, they, they had a terrible time because they weren't doing the things God wanted them to do. And... Believe it or not, Syria, not us Syria, but Syria and Israel had band together to fight against Judah because Judah wouldn't join them to fight against Assyria. And Ahaz, in his reign, he decided that he would go up to Assyria and make a covenant with the king of Assyria, and the king of Assyria would fight for him against Syria and Israel. And that was around 722 B.C. Shortly thereafter, Israel fell because of their idolatry and everything like that. But it, uh, Judah found themselves in bondage to Assyria because they had made this agreement with them. They were paying tribute. And then we have King Hezekiah come along and said, we ain't paying tribute anymore. We're not going to worship the gods of Assyria. We're not going to let the idols remain. We're not going to let the Ashtoreths stay. We're not going to uh, worship any other god except God. And of course it made the Assyrians mad, but when he took that stand, God blessed that. In fact, he thwarted the Assyrian army, and they never again, after that, that uh, siege of Jerusalem, they never again rose to conquer Jerusalem. It's interesting that these people had seen all of these things, and now they were about to go under the rule of Manasseh, another evil king, another one who said, hey, bring it all on, bring the idols, bring the, the false worship, bring it all, it's all good. The reality of it was, this is why Isaiah would say things like, it needs to stop. And why God would say, these people aren't listening. They're obstinate. All they were doing was following whatever king was there. And they were rejecting what the heavenly king, their God, was telling them. Their hearts became insensitive. That's why it says in verse 10, render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. This is almost a satire. This isn't, this isn't like... 
uh, okay, they've been doing all right so far, but now I'm going to make it where they can't and just really mess them up. Well, he was, he was this kind of satiristic uh, comment on God's behalf. They won't listen. So I want you to just keep speaking it and keep speaking it and keep speaking it and keep speaking it until they're just so sick and tired of hearing it that they act on it. You know, that would be a terrible thing, but isn't that what we go through as well? How many times have I had to tell you, how many times do you use that? That line with family or your children. How many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you this is going to hurt you? How many times do I have to tell you stay away from that boy? How many times do I have to tell you stay away from you? How many times do I have to tell you clean your room? How many times do I have to... You know, there, there comes a point where that persistence is there and it just polarizes them even further. I'm going to do it anyway. And that's where the people had come to. They had come to a place of polarization against the things of God. And so Isaiah's job was to speak a message that wasn't going to be popular with the people. And he says, render their ears this way. In other words, make this be the way that it is. Because they're not listening. His message will harden people's hearts because they don't want to hear the truth. Thinking that things are okay. Their hearts become callous. When I was growing up, I, I still, I don't have a guitar anymore, but my mom and dad bought me a classical guitar because I wanted to play. My dad had a, had a, a Martin guitar and and uh, it was real nice, but he wouldn't let me touch it because it was a Martin. It, kids are, if you know anything about Martins, you'll know that they're very expensive. Um, this one wasn't, it was a beat up old model of it and everything, but it was special my dad, so he never would let me use it. So one year they bought me a guitar, and the first guitar they bought me was a classical guitar. And if you've ever played the classical guitar, the strings are like that far from the neck. They're not really, they're about like this. But when you're pushing on down on with your fingers, and they're steel strings instead of plastic strings or nylon strings, that steel really hurts. And I, I remember I looked at my fingers, I played a few chords and it was it was a horrendous sound, but I'd put my, my fingers there and I'd hold it down and I'd strum it and beat on it and everything like that, just trying to endure the pain because dad said, you know, the more you, you rub your fingers on the strings and stuff like that, um, the, the more callous they'll become and you'll be able to, to uh, play and it won't be so hard. And uh, I didn't know any better, so I just kept pushing those strings. And one day I had this brilliant idea. I'm going to just take my finger and do like this on the string. Just rub it on there. I mean, if it's pushing down and rubbing on them and sliding on it and everything like that, it'll be great. This finger did not enjoy that trip. <laughs> and and I, I, was, I did each one of the fingers independently. And so small string, small finger. I got to tell you, that small string will cut you really quick. And it did. And it cut. And I jerked back when it did. It cut down that way. And I was like, yeah. So I had to figured out blood all over the place and all of the guitar and everything like that. I cleaned it up. I put I, I didn't touch that guitar for about two weeks. <laughs> I bandaged that thing up and loved on that thing and said, I don't know if this guitar thing is such a good idea. But I have to tell you that it has had the best callus that you could ever imagine once that healed up because of that cut. <laughs> so it's true if you do that. But I tell you what, you'll endure a lot of pain doing it. And you won't be able to play until it heals up. But it'll form a, a really good callus. And those guys who play guitars a lot, they have calluses on their finger. The reason that there's calluses there is because it's the repetition of the motion. See, when we're in sin and we're just repeating the motion, thinking that it's okay and it's okay to do that, we become calloused and hard to where we don't listen. And where we don't think that anything can hurt us. We become callous. They became calloused and, and they weren't listening. They thought everything was okay. Everything was good. Uzziah just died. He was a good king. They, they kind of didn't know what might be happening in the days ahead. But hey, we'll just follow the king. We'll just follow the earthly king. Well, he tells them in verse 11. In fact, Isaiah, he isn't questioning his call in verse 11. What he's doing is he's asking, and he's asking probably on behalf of the people. How long? And that verse it says, And I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men from far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. I gotta tell you, that everything that Isaiah said came absolutely positively true. In fact, I spoke to you just a moment ago about Israel and Syria getting together and fighting against Judah. Then we see the Assyrians fighting against Judah. And we see after the Assyrians fought against them, they, they fell into captivity to the Babylonians. And the further captivity through the Medes and the Persians. 
And finally, they were able to return back. But it wasn't until Jerusalem had been destroyed, decimated. Babylon made sure because they had had just about enough of those Israelites in Jerusalem. If you go back and look, Babylon, in fact, tried to educate their guys at first, and then went back and said, just pay your tribute money like you're supposed to. And about the third time they came back through, they were tired of messing with them. They destroyed the city and took a great majority of them into captivity over to Babylon. And a remnant remained. And it's interesting because Isaiah didn't know all that was going to happen. He wasn't there when the Babylonians came in and took the city. He wasn't there when Daniel was deported in that first deportation. He wasn't there, but he was able to tell them this is coming. And true to the words that God had spoken here, Isaiah could speak with confidence even though he wasn't going to be there when it happened. Guess what? He could see that God's word was true. And we can see it retrospectively because we see that decimation that took place into captivity. Well, if you want to read about some of that time during captivity and see what was going on in Jerusalem, go and read Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah was in Jerusalem while all that decimation had taken place. And he was still preaching the same kind of message Isaiah and Ezekiel were preaching. Same message. And he was telling them, listen to what the Lord has to say. And no, they always did it according to the humanly flesh and to what they thought. And when we do that, I promise you that that's what you listen to. Devastation is on its way. If you think that listening to the way the world says to do things is the way you ought to do it, and you listen to people who say, well, I think and, and uh, uh, I feel and all those other kind of things, you need to get back to God's Word because God's Word is real clear about a lot of this stuff. In fact, all this stuff. Because they wound up devastated. How many times have you done in your life things where you went off and said, I'm going to just do it the way I want to do it? How'd that work for them? It didn't work for them either. And God said they'll go into captivity. They're going to continue not to listen and they will wind up in captivity. And then, as our God always does, you may say, wow, that, that means they're just separated out. God hates them. He's doing all this. Believe it or not, God still loves his people. That's why I would say to you, if, if, if you're a Christian and you've done things and you've sinned and you think, man, there's just no way that's just too big, think about it. You're saying that God's grace and Jesus' blood aren't enough for you. How could we even think that? This is why we have hope in who Jesus Christ is. This is why we can have a confidence knowing that He's faithful, He's just, He's loving. And in the process of this, we find that there's a measure of hope that's given. It says in verse 13, yet there will be a tenth portion in it. And it will again be subject to burning, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Maybe saying, it just sounds like a tree got cut down. It did. Uh, a few weeks ago, we have a tree in our backyard that was growing right next to our slab. And it's, it's a tree that's, that's really fast growing, and it was already up to almost the top of our roof. And, we were looking for just about anybody who would take the tree because it's a wonderful tree. And so we, uh, we found someone who would take it. We dug it up and we carried it off. And I was thinking, thank you, Lord. We don't have to mess with that tree anymore. <laughs> Apparently, we left a little bit of that root there. Actually, two little bits of that root. And now where we had one, we got two. And you're saying mow them down, and I'm like, I don't think so. I'm going to try my very best to see if we can't give those other two away as well. <laughs> it's interesting, though, about a tree and a prophet. They share at least one thing in common. They're both planted for the future. So as Isaiah is telling these things, he is a prophet of God, and he's telling them these things are going to happen. And he says they're going to happen in a future time. The reason probably people wouldn't listen was because they had become so calloused. But he was still giving a measure of hope. Scholars, theologians, uh, banter back and forth about that tent. Was it the tent that was left there representing like people like Jeremiah after the destruction of the city? Or was it the tent that came back from captivity out of the Medes and the Persians? We really don't know, but the reality of it is, do we have to know? The reality of it is, God said, I'm not going to destroy you. I'm not going to wipe your face, uh, wipe you off the face of the earth. I love you. 
I want you back. If there's ever a time that, that you come across a place in your life and you don't get that and understand that, there's always hope when God's involved. Hope came through His Son, Jesus Christ. The Comforter comes to give us strength and education and, and to lead us and guide us in the things of God. God is very much intimately desiring to be involved in your everyday life. He wants to bring hope where there's desolation, where you may feel ineffective, where you may feel, I can't do this. There's always a measure of hope that God brings to whatever situation that you're in. And as we see this, He tells the people, it's not over. I haven't given up. And there will be a time, in fact, this particular passage refers to Jesus Christ, the root, the shoot. In fact, later on in chapter 53, he says you treated him just like the stump. When he talks about the fact that he was a, a, a reed and, and he was in a parched desert, it was the little bit of the remnant God had for God's people. If that's the God of Israel, and I know that it is, he's the same God today. And he offers us Jesus Christ. The covenant of the Old Testament was by faith. Guess what? The covenant of the New Testament is by faith. God hasn't changed that much. And when we see the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's very easy for me to put those two together and say, God's on his own. So as you think about these things and as you think about what God's called you to, you think about the things that in your life that need to be confessed. Those are things between you and Him. He's called you to do something, but it's so hard when sin gets in the way to be doing what God's called you to do. Start there, and then move forward, and know that you'll be dealing with obstinate, arrogant people who don't want to listen. But God says, I still have that message for them, because I love them. And we need to love them too. Would you stand with me?